It's my pleasure to welcome everyone here today. My name is Dr. Philip Phillips, and I'm the Associate Dean of the University Honors College. Um, I'm glad to see everyone here today. Uh, today is also an open house for uh, honor students here on our campus, and so I don't know, some of you in the audience may be here for that open house, and if you are, welcome. We're glad to have you. Uh, this series, in addition to being a class, of course, is a an event that is free and open to the public. We choose a different theme every semester, something that is important, something that is uh, currently relevant, and we invite speakers, mainly from our own campus, but also from off campus, to address whatever the topic is from different disciplinary perspectives. Today we have a special treat because we have one speaker from on campus and one speaker from off campus, both of whom are in different fields of study, but who will be presenting together today. And I've let them know that all of you are from a variety of backgrounds and experiences and you're majoring in the full range of disciplines that we offer here at MTSU. American values is a topic that is of interest to all of us, and we're trying to look at it from as many perspectives as we can. So I'm going to introduce both of our speakers and then invite them to give their presentation. Dr. Gloria Wilson <clears throat> is Assistant Professor of Art Education here at MTSU. She earned her PhD at the University of Georgia and received a Fulbright to study art, education, and culture in Japan. She's presented her research nationally and internationally, highlighting the intersections of racial identi identity and arts participation. Additionally, she's presented workshops exploring creative thinking dispositions at the Harvard Graduate School of Education's Project Zero, and was an invited artist speaker at Spelman College's Museum of Art Black Box Series. Dr. Wilson's research focuses on the social and political potential of aesthetics, culture, and education to bring about social transformation. Our next speaker is one who um, has been to MTSU before. I think this is your third time, maybe? Okay, so welcome back to Dr. Derek Griffith, who is Associate Professor of Medicine, Health, and Society at Vanderbilt University. He earned his PhD at Paul University. Dr. Griffith's research seeks to identify and address psychosocial, cultural, and environmental detriments of African American men's health and well being. Funded by several institutes within the National Institutes of Health and foundations such as the American Cancer Society and the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, Dr. Griffith specializes in informing developing and testing interventions to improve African-American men's lifestyle behaviors and chronic disease risk, morbidity and mortality, including reducing obesity and increasing healthy eating, physical activity, and screening. His work has been featured in many places such as MSN, NPR, Time Magazine, U.S. News and World Report, and USA Today. The topic of their joint presentation is Lest We Forget the Heterogeneity of Blackness, the Art of Pursuing Health Equity in Post-Black America. Please join me in welcoming our two speakers. Thank you, Dr. Phillips, for that awesome introduction. Uh, and I'm thinking that you all might be wondering how in the world uh, the worlds of uh, public health and art intersect. Uh, the conversations that Dr. Griffith and I have had over the series of the past few months um, have led us to know that those two worlds indeed, in fact, intersect um, in ways that may not be as obvious uh, at first hearing or at first glimpse. Uh, so I'd like to start today by just talking a little bit about the importance of the title and why it is even necessary to speak about the idea um, and the identity of blackness as being a heterogeneous um, concept. Um, the art world 
in general provokes many things. It provokes uh, a response to the visual. And so my area is in visual arts, but I also uh, dabble a little bit in pop culture. So my research extends into film and television. So many of you come from different disciplines in this room. Uh, some of you probably from a natural science perspective, others of you from a social science perspective, and often times in the art world what I have found as a qualitative researcher is that I need to make the case for how the qualitative gives a very different experience uh, than the qualitative. And so while both are important in and of themselves as separate entities, I believe that they also too talk to each other and intersect and inform each other in many different ways. And so the perspective that I come from is from a qualitative background and that's where social science and the art world meet. So when I think of this quote, I think of the idea that history is important when we think about the art world in general. Before coming here, I did a Google search of American values, and what came up was a pretty comprehensive list of how we as Americans see ourselves and sort of the things that we value. One of the things that became very obvious to me uh, in my search is that forward and future thinking is an orientation that we as Americans value quite a bit in relation to some other countries which are more past oriented in their thinking. And so what I would like to add to that is that I believe that we as Americans are also past oriented in our thinking and that it's necessary in order to contextualize what is happening now and very specifically what that means for this notion of blackness. So not only do we need to pay attention to the images that we see today, uh, but we also need to contextualize those images in order to get a full and more holistic view of why these images are viewed in the way that they are and the messages that we can take from them. Seven days ago, last Monday, the National Portrait Gallery unveiled the portraits of our former President Barack Obama and former First Lady Michelle Obama. These two images are historic in many ways. So when I think about the art world, I have my students and others think about what is bound up in the image and how we might begin to think about these images. I have them think about the art maker I have them think about the subject matter. I have them think about the viewer. And then I also have them think about context. So this brings me back around to thinking about um, a past-oriented stance and how we have to look at the past in order to understand what's happening here and how these portraits are very different than what has happened in the past within the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. One very distinct difference in the way that Barack Obama is presented is that he is seated, his collar is unbuttoned, he doesn't have a tie, and his background is filled with different types of foliage. If you are not paying attention to what has happened in the past and how these portraits have been created in the past, this might seem a little bit uncomfortable to consider as important to the contribution of the portraits within the National Portrait Gallery. A closer look at this image would reveal that he is surrounded by the ancestral Florida flora of his heritage. So in the background, you'll find foliage from his roots in Kenya, foliage from his roots in Hawaii, and also foliage from his connection to the Chicago area. 
If we look at Michelle Obama's portrait, she is painted by an African-American artist whose sensibilities tend to encompass all of the past, the present, and the future in one image. Even though we can see a little bit of that here, the dress that she's wearing is very contemporary. And when we take a closer look and investigate who was the maker of the dress, we'll find out that there was a social and political stance tied up into issues of identity, LGBTQ included. And so these are radical departures from what has been traditionally presented to the National Portrait Gallery. Both of the makers of these images happen to be black Americans. The subject matter happens to be that of the first black American first family. And so we can then begin to see how much uh, a departure this, this is from tradition, but how important it is as a visual. Even First Lady Michelle Obama revealed in her speech that she felt it was important for her to be painted in such a way so that she could inspire little girls that look like her to aspire to greatness. Have any of you seen this movie yet? All right, so now we turn to the cinematic universe and the importance of this movie for today. So if you know a little bit about this movie, you'll know that the director was a black American. The setting is staged in Africa, but it also has connections to the US. And you know that the characters are diverse in their personalities in their attitudes and in their roles. If you've seen this movie, or if you haven't seen this movie, um, the director also pushes back with a feminist stance in that many of the major roles are played by women who just, just so happen to also be black. This also makes me think about the fiction and the myth tied up into comic book characters, and the stories that are told through the fictive. I would also like to push back and suggest that in the fictive, we can also find the truth. So this quote by James Baldwin reveals a holistic way that we can begin to look at our history, not only as a nation, but also uh, globally. And what he's saying here is that we can acknowledge both the beauty and the things that are terrifying in order to get a holistic sense of what is happening. Because to only acknowledge one or the other is, is not truthful. What I also want to call your attention to is the idea or, or go back to is the idea that art is a storyteller. And you have to c consider within that, who is telling the story, what part of the story has been clipped, and what that means for those who are listening to the story, who is watching the story, um, and how this story can be perceived and transmitted forward. The significant role that this plays in which black Americans perceive their story and understand their story cannot be ignored. So I want to take you back a little bit in time in order to show you how the story has unfolded for black Americans in this country. And I'll do that through the visual art world. If we start here in mid-19th century, we'll notice the subject matter, as I mentioned before, which is important when you're viewing works of art. And so we'll notice that the black female figure is located in service to the other subject, which is a white female. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the Gone with the Wind narrative. Okay. And so if you'll notice and take a closer look, you'll notice that 
the black female figure is wearing a headscarf, which within the art world, we see that as a way to desexualize the human figure. So to cover up the woman's hair, uh, the association of hair with femininity uh, is necessarily covered in this. And so if you think about it, there is a, a pretty big leap um, between Edward Manet's treatment uh, of the black figure and within the narrative of the Gone with the Wind um, movie, but yet we still have the figure portrayed in a very asexualized manner. Moving forward, these two images here, the one on the left done by William Sidney Mount, Rustic Dance After a Sleigh Ride was done in the mid 19th century in 1830. And what I've done is I have highlighted for you the two black figures in the composition. If you'll notice, one is seated off to the left and the other one is in the back, just peeking out of the door. Many times artists during this time would create images that would reveal a social norm of the time or it would reveal the social order. And so most times they would portray the black figure in a lower half of the composition or somewhere in the background. If you look at Winslow Homer's piece on the right hand side, the black figure is central while the other figures are surrounding it. Going back to the idea that the idea of blackness has often been a spectacle and also a curiosity. So this quote is important to me by Maxine Green in the way that it helps us to understand that while the arts may not in and of themselves change the world, they may have the capacity to change the human beings who might then change the world. What I'd like to do now is fast forward a little bit and help you see how when the subject of the painting or the subject of the image um, now takes the lead role and is able to produce images of themselves speaking from their own voice. So we'll fast forward to mid 20th century and we'll look at all of the ways that black artists have advanced the narrative in order to portray themselves in a more human-like form. We'll look at William H. Johnson over to the left, James Van Der Zee in the middle, and Barclay Hendricks over to the right. And so during this time, it was important to paint the black figure um, as the subject matter, also as a way to clap back in a sense, uh, for the way that the figure had been portrayed in the past. And so what you'll notice is that the figures um, are portrayed usually dressed in a certain way. They could be portrayed um, just doing things that other human beings in the world were doing. Instead of being in the center, instead of being off to the side, these figures were made central, but they weren't being viewed through the lens of uh, the white artist, um, and in fact, these are all portraits made by black Americans. So pushing further the boundaries of identity, these two artists here, Jean-Michel Basquiat and Julie Moretu, uh, each have roots in America and they also have roots beyond America. Uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat is Haitian American, Julie Moretu has Ethiopian connections. And so they have pushed the boundaries just a little bit further to move past the figurative image into more of a stylized and abstract way of connecting their identity to uh, the already established art world. Um, oftentimes portraying urban or what has been called urban landscapes. Uh, the person who's not in the art world may take a look at these images and not necessarily see a connection to black identity. And so what I would say to that is that these are black artists who are expressing their identity and pushing beyond just the figurative, um, realistic portraiture style. And in this case, these could be considered extensions um, of portraits, extensions of stories about themselves. So that brings me to these two concepts here.
Sometimes I hear the word post-racial, especially as it pertains to uh, the last presidency. So the mere fact that he was able to be elected, many people decided that we must be in a post-racial era. I like to push back and think of it as a post-black era. And what that means is that blackness is not, blackness is rooted in a way of being, but it's not restricted by one homogeneous concept. Does that make sense? And so if you think back to the images that I showed you, I tried to show you a range of ways that black people as makers in the art world have tried to project themselves and usually it's in resistance to the images that were uh, myopic in nature and only characterized them in a very specific and narrow way. So this contemporary version of what I would call post-black exists on television today. I'm not sure how many of you have seen this show before, um, but it is about an upper-class black family, which is very different than what was portrayed in the Cosby show, even. And so while you have two parents who are successful in the professional world, the crux of the storyline is that the father figure is trying to wrestle with the notion that his kids have grown up in a different era than he did. And so Andre is the main character who works for an advertising agency, likes to dress um, in streetwear um, that, that he often finds is the butt of jokes for his kids because they think that he's trying to portray something and um, emulate sort of a youthful persona. Uh, but he has a son who in one, in one episode wanted a bar, mit bar mitzvah because that's what his friends were doing. And so he's having to wrestle, wrestle with the notion of what does it mean to be black today. And finally, Kara Walker's image. Kara Walker is a black American artist who tends to push the boundaries beyond understanding even to critics in the art world. And so she draws from history, so she takes a look back at what has happened as an artist who is from Stone Mountain, Georgia, and she pushes back with the notion of fiction and mythology. And she questions the violence that has happened to black Americans, but she also pushes the boundaries to have them be a part of the violence. And so what she's trying to do is she's trying to provoke the, the viewer to really ask the question about identity and about structures, who has had power, who can have power. And she does it by using the silhouette. So at first glance, you might be reminded of a Victorian past, uh, portraits that were made, and upon closer look, you then begin to see the myth and how she plays out some of these scenes through acts of violence. What I think is important to remember here is that we have to look back on our history in order to understand our present. We also have to think about the structures that have both been limiting to black Americans in the way that they could even think about themselves and in the way that they could even imagine themselves. And so in the last seven days to have the portraits of the former first lady and the former president of the United States paired with the launching of um, Black Panther, there has to be there has to be a look at how those images resonate with black people as a form of liberating the idea of blackness. So I'll turn it to my colleague, Derek. So as I tag in, let me also say my thank you to uh, Dr. Phillips for the invitation to be back. It's great to be back here again. Um, as I pick this up, as I pick up the story, I kind of want to pick up on a couple of key themes that uh, Dr. Wilson's already identified, and this idea of 
the, needing, the need to understand um, how to both look backwards and look forwards kind of simultaneously. And where do you find, if you think about this in the context of and where we got this title, was the need to find inspiration in new ways of identifying strategies to improve health and well-being and to reduce gaps between different groups in the United States. And it's not going to come from looking through the same places. It's not, the ideas are not going to come from constantly looking back at things that we've tried in the past, because if they worked in the past, then they probably would still be in place and we wouldn't need new ideas. We need to come up with new strategies, new ideas, and so forth. And so part of the reason that we, you know, came up with this duo is because we needed to come up with, well, where are these new places that we might come up with? And the art world seemed to be a very logical place to really prick and spark where we might think of new places to inspire us to think of new ideas, new ideals, new ways of thinking about the, the populations that we're talking about and how we might reimagine them in, in our context and history. And so in the same spirit, um, I kind of always use, I like this quote um, from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who, while not officially a social scientist, I kind of always say he wanted to play one in his um, quiet life because he always has these, these particular ways of framing particular issues that as a social scientist tend to really um, embrace. And so this idea that if we're thinking about issues of race and racism, that there must be a rhythmic alternation between attacking the causes and healing the effects, which is basically the idea that you know that there are two parts of when you're trying to address a particular issue and problem, you have to deal with and you think about why people are not healthy you have to deal with what, what are the things that are contributing to their poor health and well-being and why they're not doing as well as they could. But then you also have to, going forward, think about how do you heal the effects of the negative things that they might have experienced. And so how do we have this combination of dealing with reducing those barriers, those things that we've experienced in the past, and how do we then move forward? The other thing you might have seen um, is this idea of equality versus equity. And this idea of equality is one that, um, these, these are very simple terms, but become really complicated when you think about them in the context of trying to achieve success in terms of people being healthy. So usually we think of, one of the ways that we tend to think about things in terms of health is, you know, if we want everybody to be healthy, we'll do what we do here on the right, which is on, the, on your left, sorry, which is basically to give everybody the same thing. If we give everybody the same resources and the same opportunities, then they will all be equally healthy at the end. Um, however, we know that not everybody, as you can see from these particular folks who are, um, albeit stealing their way into the game, so we won't talk about the illegal nature of what they're doing, but we'll kind of pretend like this is a good thing, that they're doing something illegal for something um, you know, ulti ultimately good, um, but we'll go with that. But um, the fact that they're not paying to go to the game, we won't pay attention to that. But you have these folks who have different resources, which is what the heights represent. They have different resources that they're bringing to the table, and we're trying to figure out how do we give them the resources they need to have the same outcomes in terms of health. And so you realize that, of course, they, they obviously have different heights and different needs to be able to be successful in being able to watch the game. And the second option is to basically you know, think about, OK, the first option is to give them all the same thing. The second option is to basically give the ones who need the most the most and to give, you know, basically make the choice to give them based on their need what they might actually receive. While that is um, possible and uh, that is a, an option, it's also something that um, for some seems very politically problematic and the idea that one group would get nothing and the other group would get basically everything would be significantly problematic if you think about it from a political standpoint, that, that that would not terribly fly in a social and political standpoint and context that we're living in now or just in, really in any era that we've lived in. So what we were looking for is in this third image is what's a way to imagine removing the barrier completely? When, and we often don't think about that as a strategy or as an option. We don't think about, well, what if you, as opposed to let's fixing the problem or let's figure out how to compensate for the problem, what's a way that we can imagine eliminating the problem in the first place? And so the whole, the whole point of this third image is to basically say that one way to achieve equity is to try to figure out how you can, again, in attacking those causes, eliminate the cause of the disparities in the first place and therefore be able to produce the, the equitable health outcomes that we're looking for. Now, again, I, I want to recognize and un, 
acknowledge that I understand that being fair isn't necessarily giving everybody the same thing, but it is suggesting that we need to give everybody what they need to be successful. And that that's a political choice. Not everybody's comfortable with that choice. Not everybody agrees with that choice. But it is one option to achieve the outcome. If the goal is to have everybody be equal at the end or have equal opportunities to be healthy at the end, then there has to be some kind of adjustment for how you're going to deal with the fact that not everybody's starting from the same place if you're looking at them at a particular point in time. So let me move into health explicitly. Um, when we talk about health, usually you think about things like disease, illness, life and death, and those kinds of things. You tend to think about you know, somebody developing cancer, heart disease, and so forth. And we tend to think of actually the absence, of, of the absence or presence of disease. But in a, we've known for more than 70 years, or defined health in a much broader context for more than 70 years, and thought about this idea that health is not just simply whether or not somebody has a particular illness or not, whether or not they're you know, have a particular quality of life, but it's really thinking about well-being in a, in a very broad sort of sense. And when you ask people about their health, they usually put it in a larger social context. When you think about um, health and from, a, from a person who does more public health work, we tend to treat public health and, and people's health as though it's a more important goal than kind of every other thing that they're doing. That you should prioritize being healthy more than everything else because you need health to be successful in other areas of your life. When you talk to people, say parents or even yourselves, at different points in the semester, your health is not usually your highest priority. Your grades might be, um, doing other things for your family might be, you know, it's not like you say, okay, I'm going to be healthy. Okay, forget the fact that I'm, I haven't slept much. You know, okay, I'm going to take a day off and I'm going to, you know, take a mental health day and I'm going to, you know, my professors will understand, you know, Dr. Phillips will understand if I don't come to class. I need a mental health day. I need to go get a massage. I'm going to take my tuition dollars and go, go on vacation. Forget all that. You know, I've got to really take care of myself. And that sounds like a great idea. And some of the messages, some of the narratives, some of the media images that you would get from health professionals would suggest something that radical. However, when you talk to people, that's not really an option for them. It's not an option to basically say that health should be your highest priority. It has to fit in the context of their lives. So it tends to, you know, if you think about, you know, yourselves and even family, it tends to come after basically your ability to sort of provide for yourself or to have you help provide for others. It comes after you've tried to make sure that you have a safe place to live and safe place to survive, whether or not you have energy and time to be you know, part of a family or part of a community that's important to you. So it's thinking about these things in that context and thinking about health. We need to define health in a broader sense of how people actually make sense of it. So I will, unfortunately, you know, as one who lives in the world of data, I have to show you some numbers or some things that represent numbers, so just bear with me. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to sort of talk about is um, this image here, uh, this figure that shows the, the changes in life expectancy over more than 100 years. And um, if you were in my racial and ethnic health disparities class, I would basically make you unpack this whole image. And in the interest of time, I won't do it, but I'll kind of do it for you. Um, so if you come guess like if you come to my class or you, you know if we can do some exchange or something and figure out whether or not you can come take my class, you know I'll have you'll be I can sort of call on you to figure this out. So what we have are two things. What you see is that everybody is living longer and presumably therefore being healthier. What you also see though is when you look at the particular gaps that existed in 1900, that um, there were there were racial gaps then and there are racial gaps now. There were not gender gaps then, but they are now. And it's an odd question that we don't tend to ask in a lot of the health equity work that I do, is that why is it that those who we identify and characterize as male don't, haven't benefited as much from our technological advances as, we have, as women have in our society, regardless of racial and ethnic group. If I were to break this out by more groups, we would see that. But there's something going on that we haven't sort of understood. And the other thing we tend to do in the context of health, when we think about health differences or health disparities, and um, disparities just being differences that we tend to feel is unjust or um, that, that are problematic in some way. So a health difference that we wouldn't see as necessarily problematic is, you know, grandma dying before her grandkids is not necessarily something that we would necessarily see as problematic. 
you know, if, if grandma only had 10 more years to live, that's usually less of a problem. If her grandkid had a little more than, you know, only about 10 years left to live, that would be a problem in our society. We would see that as something that, as a, in a larger sense, that we need to fix. And so disparities are these kinds of differences that we see as problematic that we actually need to address as opposed to just differences that we see uh, that we can actually live with and that being uh, those who are older having shorter life expectancy than those who are younger is something we've learned to live with. Racial and ethnic differences and so forth are something that we've said are something that we need to deal with. Uh, socioeconomic differences as well. Um, gender is not something that we've sort of seen in that same light and I'm not going to get into this too much but I've got to do it since one of my day jobs is actually doing research on men's health. I've got to put a plug in for this kind of somewhere. So here it is. Um, the second part of this, though, is we tend to think about health usually through a physical health lens. And we tend to think about racial disparities in this kind of physical health lens. But what I want to actually show you is that when you think about these things, it becomes a really complicated pattern that you actually don't see the same patterns we know that mental health and physical health, we, we believe that stress has some implications for both. But the question is, why don't they affect different racial and ethnic groups the same way? So MDE is major depressive episode, GAD is general, generalized anxiety disorder, and then you see diabetes, asthma, and hypertension. And what you see, um, the gray bars are non-Hispanic whites, the black bars are blacks. And what you see is that blacks have a dramatically higher rate of chronic diseases, such as diabetes, hypertension, and even asthma, but a lower rate of mental health issues, such as anxiety disorders and depression. When we think about health disparities and we think about health, we don't tend to use these kind, this balance of well, how do we understand the fact that uh, black Americans tend to have a lower rate of mental health disorders, but a higher rate of physical health disorders. We don't tend to put that, comple that complexity into the picture of how do we make sense of these kind of differences. The other thing we don't tend to do is look at within subgroups of particular groups. And I know this is hard to see, but this has gotten a lot of attention in the last about five years or so, that um, non-Hispanic whites who don't have a college degree um, so this will be particularly pertinent to some of you, um, are actually their health is actually declining. And it's the first time that we've actually seen these kinds of decline in health. The other thing that we're starting to see with this particular population, and we've honed in on those who are in their mid-50s as one of the particular groups where we've seen this trend actually re really um, become problematic, is this idea that um, the mortality rate, so in the other graphs, going, numbers going down is bad. Um, this one, numbers going up are bad. So the fact that the mortality rate is actually increasing is a bad thing, meaning that people's rate of dying is, going, is increasing as opposed to declining. So for, something, for some reason, those who are middle-aged and white and have less than a high school um, diploma are dying at higher rates than most of their other counterparts within the United States. And we don't have a good understanding for why that's happening within this particular recent 15-year period. This isn't usually in the conversation, and if we're troubling this idea of what's a disparity, if we're trying to complicate this idea of where do we look for potential strategies to intervene, we need to look very broadly and not just sort of potentially at the black population, but you need to look at what's affecting our overall society and our overall population to think about where are the places that we might intervene. There's dramatic differences even just between non-Hispanic whites overall and those without a high school diploma. And this is suggesting that this, there's something really different about those two groups that we don't tend to think about in this conversation around health disparities. But we, this is potentially some place that we need to go. So I'm going to speed through some of this in the interest of time um, and get to this idea of return to this idea of um, blackness. And so in this context of what we've sort of presented to you thus far, again, part of what we're looking for is inspiration, motivation, and where do we find new ideas and so forth. And so one of the things that you can look in, in terms of popular culture is where do people find things that inspire them? Where do people find things that tend to make them feel good about themselves? And so this quote is just, you know, when um, we have these new images that we've seen in the last week or so um, that, you know, are, are for, you know, for all the things that have been going on in the last probably 
year, year and a half of the um, police involved shootings and the other things that where you've seen black people being very um, um, present in the, in the popular culture and in the media, it's not exactly been a very happy sort of time and space for black people. It's not exactly been a space where you've seen a lot of very positive images. And so to have on the, on the heels of those things, these positive images that have happened in the last week, it's going to be interesting to see what kind of response and what kind of imagery these things are, are allowed to, to hold on to and to move forward. And so one of the things that um, Kamal Bell was talking about in this particular quote is that when he was a teenager, there were certain things that these are, way, these are predating uh, most of you, if not all of you, because this is when I was about your age, that the, you had these idea of wearing things like fake kente cloth and you know, red, black, and green, everything, which are kind of these African liberation colors. Um, Bob Marley, this, that, and whatever, which I guess is probably still relatively popular sometimes. Um, but you had all these different things about trying to find your own identity. And there were different ways of doing that by sort of representing yourself in different ways. But one of the things that's more important than how you do it is whether or not you do it. And one of my favorite, um, quotes is from um, Muhammad Ali, where he's talking about, um, you know, I don't, I know where I'm going, and you kind of have to, it's again, he's sort of identified this source of internal motivation for himself. He's identified sort of where he's going, what his aspirations are, what his goals are, and figured out that he doesn't have to kind of follow this particular narrative of things that in the past may have been the black or post-black sort of idea. Or, or even post-racial kind of idea. The idea that race doesn't matter, which would have been the post-racial, or that black is this sort of singular notion, he kind of troubled both of those in his particular time and in his own particular way. And even though this was 30 plus years ago, 40 years ago now probably, um, that he kind of decided that he's gonna be black the way that he wanted to. He's gonna be an American the way that he wanted to. And with all the consequences that came with that. And so sometimes people look to their faith for doing that and look to you know, different ideas. Sometimes, again, some people look to culture. But it's kind of figuring out where do you find these different things on which you build these ideas and motivation to address uh, these kinds of problems. So as I close, I want to kind of go back to something that um, we didn't talk about explicitly, or Dr. Wilson didn't talk about explicitly when she started but that um, is often used to kind of represent this idea of being black, post-black, this idea of racial and post-racial, that one of the challenges that Ralph Ellison talked about in this opening quote from um, his book, Invisible Man, and actually um, one of the gifts I got recently for the holidays um, was this collaboration that happened between Ralph Ellison and Gordon Parks, who's a famous uh, photographer and, and otherwise artist, where he and uh, Ralph Ellison actually collaborated on um, a series of images. And in addition to the book, um, Invisible Man, that's a classic, um, talking about this unnamed black character and his experiences in uh, the United States and particularly the South, um, that there was also this image of, or this set of images and pictures that they took where they were trying to capture the diversity of what it meant to be black and just this idea of these men who um, they saw as invisible during this particular time. And so they did a series of pictures in Harlem and in different other places that were featured in Time Magazine and so forth, but until recently they hadn't actually been able to release that full set of images and pictures, and it's now sort of available as a book. But this idea of, of people being invisible for their full humanity being completely invisible or certainly partially invisible is part of this whole idea narrative that, that we were troubling in this idea of the heterogeneity of being black and this idea of coming up with ways to inspire us to address health and health equity. And so he says, you know, I'm an invisible man. I'm invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. When they approach me, they see only my surroundings, themselves, or figments of their imagination, indeed everything and anything except me. And in this, he's saying that it's not a matter, some of this is a matter of choice. It's a matter of kind of willfully saying that I'm not, I have a particular viewpoint of how I'm going to see you, and I'm not going to try to see you from your own perspective or see you through your own lens. 
I'm going to basically decide that I want to see you as a particularly flat and two-dimensional character rather than potentially acknowledging that there may be ways that you see yourself or that we, as, if we were to become um, in more relationship, that we may actually start to see each other as more human and as more um, three-dimensional beings. And so as I close, I want to say two things. One is that, you know, one of the things we try to leave you with is that art and daily life may offer insights into diverse roots of strength on which we build interventions to promote the health of black Americans. I know I didn't get too much into building interventions and so forth, but the short version of building interventions is you can't build interventions by beating people over the head with bad information as much as things like the Truth Campaign, which you've probably seen many times, um, where it just gives you shocking information or the person with the, you know, trying to get you to not smoke by showing you the person who has the trach tube and says, all, you know, sounds kind of scary and all that kind of stuff. That usually doesn't work very well, just, you know, FYI, we can tell our government this too. Um, but those kind of strategies of scaring people, those kind of fear messages actually don't work very well when we've tested them. Um, but it's the most common thing, it's very consistent with our values and our culture that if we tell people information, that that's going to motivate them to change. We know that actually from a social science standpoint that that actually doesn't work. And so we have to find things that give people a source of motivation to do the things that we want them to do while we actually make efforts to change the environments where they are, which is why we had the images, or I started with the images of the, the, three, the, the people trying to first um, adjust for the context of the, the wall and basically give people different opportunities to adjust to that or simply figuring out how you're going to eliminate the wall itself to be able to then watch the game. So we have to find ways to come up with these more complex strategies that will allow us to do these kinds of things, but it has to be within that particular context. Uh, being black is a very complicated concept and it's becoming even more complex as we move forward in our society. And it's a good proxy, unfortunately, um, for things that, that are health harming. But it's also an important foundation for um, positive things that people are actually embracing and take into their themselves as a way to um, build on something positive. In the masculinities world or in the men's health world, there's this idea of mosaic masculinities where you sort of pick of the things that we think of what maleness needs to be. And people choose, men choose kind of what's the important parts to them and they reconfigure what that ideal is to them. And what we're saying here is that there could be a similar sort of mosaic blackness, if you will, where black people are choosing different identities and they're piecing together the things that are important to them in this new way of thinking about, in this particular context, how am I still gonna feel like a good person? How am I still gonna feel good about myself? And how can that be the foundation of how I survive in a complicated world? And not only do we have to um, identify the determinants of the problem, but identify what's going to inspire forward movement. Um, one of my colleagues um, and mentors um, often makes a very bad joke that, you know, it's how do we understand why black people aren't crazier than we are? With all the stuff that black people have experienced and dealt with and in the context of, of the different issues that we've seen historically and contemporarily, why aren't, why aren't black people just worse off? And the answer is there's something in the positives about that, that the community has seen in the way that we kind of embody what it means to be an American, what it means to be black, that we've seen that we build on something within ourselves to do that. And it's a, it's a, it's a question of figuring out how do we tap into those things. And so let me end with a very unusual place, um, that of Tupac. Um, not exactly. I had to throw something in here. I mean, last time it was Despicable Me, this time I've got to come up with something different. But in this, in this quote, um, Tupac, for all the complexity that he was, was also quite an accomplished poet. And um, the reason I really like this particular poem, The Rose That Grew From Concrete, is because he really talks about not just sort of the complexity of these particular issues, but this idea that we really need to pay attention to you know, we, we can often miss the mark. If you think about the quote I gave you from Invisible Man, that we tend to only look at certain aspects of the black population through a negative lens and only through a particular way. But he's saying that, you know, you wouldn't ask a rose that grew from concrete that had damaged petals um, why, it had the, why it had these particular scratches on the petals. Why did the, the rose not look as pretty as something that grew in a particular environment that was much more conducive to growing? 
And in the same way, you wouldn't look at black people in a particular way, in a particular lens. You need to kind of take them out of that particular context. On the contrary, you would celebrate its tenacity. We would all love to reach the sun. Well, we are the roses, and this is the concrete, and these are my damaged petals. Don't ask me why, ask me how. And I think that's really the question for us going forward. It's not asking why do these disparities exist, but it's asking how are we going to move forward and how are we going to address these issues as we go forward. So thank you.